Hi friends, welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus Adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. Let's try together to understand the reasons for the defeat of Paulus' army in Stalingrad. The autumn has started cold and unfriendly. Only seldom could one now sit on a bench in the park. Our daily walks became shorter. The gardening work for this year was also over. Therefore, to fill my time, I carved chess figures, cigarette holders, tobacco pipes, and other things that gave small pleasures here and there. Out of the paper from cigarette packets, we made playing cards so that we could play scat or other card games in the long evenings. Several hours of the day were spent on books, including well-spirited and political literature, as well as on learning the Russian language, to which the Soviet camp interpreter gave us a friendly introduction. However, the question that was burning in my soul found no answer that way. What was happening at home? What about our loved ones? My fundamental mood was perfectly summed up by these lines from Heinrich Hain. I think of Germany in the night and then I fall asleep. General Hans Wohls, the former artillery commander of the 4th Corps, left us at this time. He had disconnected himself from the false community of resisting generals in Vojkovo and went to Lunjovo, the seat of the National Committee Freies Deutschland. Surprisingly, Generals Rosk and Rodenberg also went off on journeys. I learned from Ross that he too had decided for the League of German Officers. Nevertheless, in our talks within a small group, he maintained a pertinent, reasonable behavior. Actually, he had also made contact with the National Committee, but then became sick and returned to Vojkovo. He also confirmed that Rodenberg had joined the League of German Officers and was working together with Sedlitz and Lunjovo. That hit the camp like a bomb. Rodenberg, a bastion of the war extenders, a member of the League of German Officers. Had he really made up his mind? Later, Lieutenant General Rodenberg turned out to be an accomplice of SS Obersturm Banfer, Lieutenant Colonel Huber, who had been taken prisoner as commander of a unit on the Volga. He had stood out at the Yellow Buddha camp as a member of the National Committee. Rodenberg and Huber in the summer of 1944 had wanted Captain Stolz and Lieutenant Dot Rolimzig, who had been given a National Committee document, to be released to go over to the Wehrmacht. They were to give the Gestapo details about the work, composition, and location of the National Committee. The next well-camouflaged attempt, which could be covered through the regard the Soviet government had for the National Committee, was able to be foiled. The main responsibility for this attempted diversion fell on General Rodenberg, and he was banished from the League of German Officers. Fully unexpectedly, the group of obstinate generals lost their spokesman. Colonel General Heitz, the tough soldier with a sound appetite who covered five kilometers every day in the camp, some of it at the trot, had become ill. Following a temporary recovery, his condition deteriorated. He became completely emaciated. Professors from Ivanovo and Moscow were summoned. They confirmed cancer. The colonel general was conveyed to a hospital in Moscow, but he could not be saved. The disease had already spread too far, and he died soon afterwards. In the spring of 1944, I got to know my friend Arno von Lenski in the League of German Officers. He was generally, and by me particularly, regarded as a man of outstanding character always open-minded and warm-hearted towards those who found themselves in real difficulty. He was also sincere and open in his assessment of those who remained overbearing in age, lies, and perniciousness, and misused the real arguments. A former cavalry officer, himself coming from an old officer family and often connected with the Prussian-German army, Major General von Lenski had found it particularly difficult. As a man of strongly rooted beliefs, to take such a revolutionary step. That he did so underlined, however, his spirited nature, his worldliness, and his critical ability. For me, Arno von Lenski was the best of comrades in the spiritually difficult moral conflicts of this time, a man whose participation and sympathy I could depend on in every difficult situation. He, like me, had watched the war situation for Germany constantly worsen since the founding of the National Committee and the League of German Officers. On the 6th November 1943, Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, was reconquered by Soviet troops. Italy had already surrendered unconditionally on the 3rd September 1943. 
On the 26th of November 1943, a salute was fired in Moscow to celebrate the liberation of Gomel. In January 1944, the Red Army broke through the German front in great depth near Leningrad at Nagorod on the Oman Lake and at Volchov, respectively. At the end of January 1944, the National Committee, Freies Deutschland, had analyzed the situation at the front in detail in a full session. Together with Lenski, I studied the speeches and resolutions of this meeting. What enlightened me above all was Walter Ulbricht's shrewd comparison with the situation in 1918, which I essentially already knew from his October 1943 article in the Freies Deutschland newspaper. How is the situation with the German army at the beginning of this winter? He asked. Hitler has almost run out of reserves. In addition to this, the Luftwaffe is so weakened that it is completely incapable of protecting the German industrial areas. Without doubt, Germany's situation and that of the German army are worse than in 1918. Then he cited a description that Field Marshal von Hindenburg had given in his book From My Life. The then chief of the general staff of the field army had written, Ever smaller is the number of German troops, ever larger are the gaps in the defensive positions. We have no new forces to deploy like the enemy. Instead of fresh America, we have only exhausted allies and they are close to collapsing. How much longer will our front be able to bear this vast stress? I asked the question, the most difficult of all questions. When must we come to an end? Hindenburg saw no more possibility than of winning the war. He also knew that the Allies were declining to conduct negotiations with Kaiser Wilhelm II and the then war government. Together with Ludendorff, he demanded the immediate formation of the new government, which he confirmed in his book with the following words. All of this compels me and forces the decision to seek an end that is an honorable end. No one will say, too soon. The retreat of the Kaiser's government in 1918 had to wait some time. Meanwhile, a military collapse was ever more obvious. Walter Ulbricht established that Hindenburg, who was thoroughly loyal to the Kaiser, still had the courage to show his supreme commander the bankruptcy of his war policy and to demand the formation of a new government that Germany's enemies would be prepared to deal with. The same demand had already long stood before Hitler's army leaders, who had the power in their hands to tumble the Hitler government in accordance with the will of the people and the army. Walter Ulbricht concluded his contribution with the words, The united and courageous people and army are dealing through the National Committee, Freies Deutschland, in order to make it possible to overturn the Hitler government and achieve peace on the basis of freedom and the national independence of our German people. As little as von Lenski, or even Paulus, could I talk about Ulbricht's comparison with 1918 to close this argument? We were painfully disappointed at not detecting any strong echo, nor any earnest consequences on the part of an army commander or other high Wehrmacht commander. They seemed to want to go on serving Hitler to a total catastrophe for the people and army. This fact must also have an effect on the work of the Freies Deutschland movement. The generals who remained openly faithful to Hitler did not think that it was possible for the Wehrmacht to make an orderly withdrawal to the right borders to enable a ceasefire. The former solution could therefore not be repeated. In order at least to save the lives of many officers and soldiers and to shorten the hopelessly lost situation, while daily streams of blood and millions of material assets still contributed to the continuation of the war, the National Committee, Freies Deutschlands, set up a new resolution. Suspension of the fighting and defecting to the side of the National Committee, Freies Deutschland. At first glance, I was alarmed when I read the National Committee's altered resolution. Did it not mean a disbandment of the front, a call for disintegration, the creation of chaos? I bore these questions day and night around with me and spoke to Lenski and Paulus about them, but then came to the conclusion that this solution of the National Committee offered a practical way out for the comrades at the front. Chaos and the disintegration of the Wehrmacht had been going on for a long time. This was not because of the National Committee, but was exclusively the fault of Hitler and his holding on generals. Whoever wanted to save themselves on the Eastern Front must break through in the way advised by the Freies Deutschland movement. Yet another question concerned me. In December 1943, the heads of state or heads of the governments of the Soviet Union, the USA and Great Britain met in Tehran. 
The determination of the Allies to fight on until Hitler's Germany surrendered unconditionally drove the diehards of Wojkovo into a fury once more. On revised grounds, they sought to shift the blame for this decision from the German fascists to the National Committee. But who was actually conducting the war? The Hitler Wehrmacht or the National Committee Freies Deutschland, who had changed its whole character, Goebbels or Weiner? Gradually, such stupid, hateful blackening of the last remains of traditional cohesion tore a rift between von Lenski, me and several other searchers on one side, and the majority of the incorrigibles among the generals in Voikovo on the other. Certainly, it was not easy for us to look stark reality in the eye. But what else could we expect after all that had happened? We also had no rights or guarantees to demand. I myself was nevertheless of the firm opinion that unconditional surrender did not mean the destruction or enslavement of the German people, but rather getting rid of the Hitler state, the Hitler Wehrmacht, and Hitler politics forever. After von Lenski had left Foykovo, Paulus said to me, Now I am anxious to know what you were up to. Actually, you should have gone with von Lenski. I know, though, why you were staying. I too have become cleverer during the last year. If you want to join the League of German Officers, then don't let me hold you back. We will always remain what we were in the years of fighting and conflict together, good friends. I would only leave you, Field Marshal, if I was urgently required elsewhere. For both of us it came sooner than expected. At the beginning of July 1944, I was taken to Krasnogorsk. A few days after my arrival, a transport arrived with officers who had been captured in the Crimea. Among others, I got to know the first general staff officer of an infantry division, whose name I have since forgotten. Above all, I wanted to know from him what effect the fall of the 6th Army at Stalingrad had on the German people. Officially, you are all dead. Hitler himself has said that often enough. At the beginning of February the year before last, there were three days of general mourning. The state radio broadcast a report of a German pilot who had flown over Stalingrad in the last hours. He had observed how the department store in whose cellar Paulus was sitting with the army's staff had been blasted to pieces. A further visible explosion had darkened the sky. In illustrated newspapers there appeared drawings of Paulus and some staff officers, surrounded by the dead, joining in the fight with machine pistols to the last bullet. Your superior was depicted in many speeches, press reports, and radio broadcasts with a halo round him. We all wanted to avenge your deaths. Yes. So you say, but did word not trickle through that Paulus, Seitlitz, Daniels, and many others were still alive? Yes, of course, replied the Aya, but first gradually and only one at a time. The whole truth about the fate of the Sixth Army is hardly known by anyone at home today. What is known comes from the activity of the National Committee, Freies Deutschland. But we have been writing regular postcards home for one and a half years, I returned. I happen to know that they do arrive in Germany. Perhaps you can remember the former adjutant of the 11th Corps. He was head of the final staff in Stalingrad. In confidence, he told me that on Hitler's orders the postcards from the Stalingrad prisoners of war may not be delivered to their relatives. They are lying in a Spandau fort. That is indeed a complete secret. I am very sorry, but you cannot say anything about this in Voikovo camp where some of the generals obstinately assert that the Russians would hold back the cards. During the time of my stay in Krasnogorsk, there also occurred a personal encounter with Otto Ruhl, my later friend and co-author of this book. I was on a stroll through Camp 27 when I was greeted by a young officer. From his dialect, I believed I recognized a fellow Hessian, and I asked him where he came from. He announced that he was a born Schwabian. We had often been not far from each other in the cauldron, he being at the main dressing station of the 305th Infantry Division, the Bodensee Division, later at Field Hospital in Stalingrad Center, myself at Army Headquarters. From Otto Roll, I then discovered that on the 30th January 1943, he had been taken prisoner on the other side of Red Square about 300 meters from the department store. He had already joined the National Committee Freies Deutschland a year ago. I was happy to get to know this sympathetic Wurdenberger, not knowing that four years later he would become a close friend. I was waiting for a talk with my friend Arno von Lenski, with whom I wanted to briefly discuss my joining the League of German Officers. During a year and a half of captivity I had learnt that many apparently simple things needed his attention. 
but it was the often heard Russian expression for it. So I was patient, spending my time reading, going for walks, chatting. On the 21st July 1944, I was already sitting at the open window of my room when I heard that the prisoners of war were to assemble on the camp street. I went out into the open air and sat on a bench next to the entrance to the blockhouse in which I lived. The interpreter excitedly appeared with a copy of Pravda before him and read with a loud voice that on the 20th July a bomb attack had been made on Hitler. During a conference at the headquarters near Lutzen, Colonel Graf Schenk von Stauffenberg had detonated a bomb. Hitler and several generals were lightly wounded. General Schmunt was dead. Like all the assembled prisoners of war officers and soldiers, I held my breath. Stauffenberg I knew fleetingly from a visit to the staff of the Styx Army. At the mention of his name, I jumped up and got closer to the interpreter so that I did not miss a word. So the thought went through my head, there are forces in the homeland who are drawing conclusions about Hitler's catastrophic policies and are taking action. I was inwardly happy that resistance against Hitler should become apparent in the homeland in this way, and at the leave of German officers I waited intently for further news. Moreover, I was happy that among the rebels, in addition to Stauffenberg, were such men as Field Marshal von Wisselben, Colonel General Beck, Generals Felgebel and Olbricht, and Colonels Fink, Mertz von Kornheim and others. I was disappointed that Hitler, with those generals and officers, as well as the SS, hit back so relatively weakly at the resistance and dealt with the conspirators bloodily. The rebels' main error was doubtless that they believed they could dispose of Hitler in a small coup, in contrast to the National Committee Freies Deutschland, which saw in the mass of the people and the army the forces to overthrow Hitler and form a truly national, peace-loving and democratic Germany. Dear friends, that's all for today. Please support my channel with any comment. Thanks a lot. It was Tim and see you.